Um, I'm uh, something of a, a science cross-dresser. Um, so I'm your link man between this morning's session uh, on lasers and this afternoon's session uh, on <coughs> optical fiber technology. And of course, we are celebrating uh, two Nobel Prizes representing each, each uh, of those. So um, that's a huge honor for me. And, uh, but it, in defense of myself, I should say that I did actually start uh, my MSc in working on laser technologies uh, under David Hanna, uh, then switched, uh, hence the cross-dressing, uh, into optical communications under Professor Gambling, worked on that uh, until the whole industry crashed, and then I fled back to laser technology. Uh, so uh, I span both of them, and I'm going to try to do that uh, in this talk, and also uh, to give uh, people uh, something of a trailer of the fun and tremendous talks that uh, you're going to have this afternoon. So let me start with uh, a fiber laser, which is uh, marking um, this particular uh, piece of stainless steel. Um, it's, it's a great introduction, but you've probably got something on you today. Uh, that has been marked by a laser, a pen or your car keys, something like that. Um, they, there is a huge increase in recent years in the industrial use of lasers. And I'd like to thank uh, Bill O'Neill for some of the, uh, the movies that, uh, that I will be using uh, from the University of Cambridge. He's very good at uh, scouring the interweb, internet to find these things. So as I've said, um, Celebrating two people, and I'm going to show the connection, which is not obvious. Um, I should also point out, by the way, uh, and it's not an accident, that this is also the 100th anniversary uh, of the Nobel Prize to Marconi, thus representing the two telecommunications technologies which dominate today, uh, namely uh, the mobile phone and the internet. So, let's go. Here's something you don't often see. A press release with a 10 to the fourfold underestimate. So those of you that are sitting at the back may not be able to see this, but this is actually uh, the press release put out by SDL Laboratories uh, here on the 26th of January, 1966, in which they observed, talking about optical fibers, they have exhibited an information carrying capacity of one gigacycle per second, I assume, um, today, that's 10 to the 4 times that. And this bit, the best readily available low-loss material has a loss of about 1,000 dBs per kilometer, which is true, actually, at that time. This is when I switched from laser technology because Professor Gambling said to me, a young PhD student, very naive, how would you like to make optical fibers and produce a telecommunication system? Being fairly wary, I said, well, how far can we get through the fiber so far? And he said, about a meter. And I said, well, how far would you like to get through? He said, maybe 20 kilometers. So with typical arrogance of youth, I said, not a problem. I'll do that. <laughs> well, actually, I did. Um, but before that, um, we had the way pointed, and as I will show you in just a moment. So this is what uh, Charles was confronted with um, when, in, when he did his remarkable work uh, in the 60s, most prescient, predicting not, not just that it was silica, by the way, that was the way to go, but also that single mode um, was the way to go when everybody else was doing multi-mode. You'll hear a lot about that this afternoon. So this is um, what... That the evolution of glass losses, and of course this area here represents the great German era of optics, uh, led by people like Otto Schott, um, who produced a vast factory for producing the most amazing optical glasses, and we, we should give enormous credit uh, in glass technology to, uh, to that era. But this is what Charles was confronted with, and this, of course, is when I joined... That's me. <laughs> and it would be disingenuous to, point to, to assume that that drop was entirely <laughs> due to my work. 
Um, the official history is shown here, and I only use this very specifically um, to give a trailer to a, a fascinating talk that uh, my old friend Pete Schultz is going to give. Because the accepted history here is that Cow and Hockham uh, and Cow and Jones predict this in 68, but it takes another further two years before uh, Mara Keck and Schultz actually took this recommendation and made it real. And Pete will be talking all about that this afternoon, and, and that's a fascinating talk. And then, of course, uh, in 73, uh, McChesney and Bell Labs produces a, an alternative way of making things. What isn't shown here is that simultaneously with that, we at Southampton actually did the same thing. And um, the publications are dated 10 days apart, by the way. But I wanted to bring this point out, that in desperation trying to copy what was going on here, in Corning, people all over the world were coming up with alternative ways of doing it because we didn't know how to dope the silicas, which is what Pete had done uh, with his co-workers. And so the single material fibre, just using silica, appeared uh, from Bell Labs, Peter Kaiser. And, and today, that was reinvented again at Southampton um, and uh, in the so-called microstructured fibre. is the earliest example of a microstructured fibre. Liquid core, which is something that I did and Bell Labs did as well, um, and I think that might well come back because there's some interesting nonlinear effects. And this one, phosphosilicate, which is what I did at, uh, at Southampton because I couldn't afford what Corning had done, the germanium um, work, so I found an alternative. And that, by the way, today is the basis of all optical fiber lasers because it overcomes a photo darkening. So there's an interesting connection that was going on here. So I'm very much picking up the point uh, that Charles Towns was making, that you, know, you don't always watch what's going on around you, and you don't always recognize the importance of the environment that you live in. So the next thing that happened was uh, the, we, could, we could produce low-loss fibers, we could get through 100 kilometers, but that still didn't get you across an ocean. Uh, so how did you amplify the light when it was appropriate. And this is uh, when two groups came in, and I'm extremely fortunate that my old friend uh, Emmanuel de Sevier is here, and he's going to tell you everything about this this afternoon and its impact. So that's a fascinating uh, area because he was working uh, in Bell Labs simultaneously with us uh, at Southampton, putting erbium into the fiber itself in order to make an amplifier. So here you begin to see the convergence of two incredibly important technologies, which continues today, and I'm going to show you some of that. The silica work that, uh, that had been done in, in, uh, originally in Corning, then into Bell Labs and at Southampton, and then bringing back the ideas of doping the fiber uh, to make an amplifier. And this was a revolution. I mean, it led to the internet that we have today, and you're going to hear about that this afternoon. So that's my trailer uh, for this afternoon. For the rest of today, I uh, want to talk about this. Remember that press release, 10 to the 4, underestimate. Here's something else they'd said. The fibre is capable of carrying 10 milliwatts of power. Right. <laughs> About that estimate of 10 milliwatts. Imagine we bring together the following. Theodore Maiman, the first working laser in 1960. Eli Snitzer, that has already been mentioned. A great pioneer of glass lasers working in American optical uh, in the early 60s. Demonstrated the fiber laser, but he didn't have silica. He didn't have single mode fibers and he didn't have pump sources. So, sorry, Eli, bad timing, window was wrong. But he demonstrated. And then along comes Charles Cow, the silica telecom fiber, 1965, produced ultra-low loss. Why is that important? Because, it turns out, it's incredibly important to have meter lengths of fiber lasers and amplifiers because you can't dope very strongly in the core. So you need them, they're all long. So if you don't have a low-loss medium, you're not going to be able to exploit this technology. And then you bring these guys along. Um, this is uh, Emmanuel that you'll see this afternoon, his colleague Randy Giles and myself and my team here. 
with the fiber amplifier, which was announced in January 87, and ask, what does that lead us to? And it leads us to the high-power fiber laser. But what about that 10 milliwatt stuff? Actually, that was said to me, because when we started publishing in this area, I did a big tour of the US military uh, laboratories, and they all said, interesting, a new laser. Give out 10 milliwatts. Uh, we'll call you whenever we need a new laser with 10 milliwatts capability. So we said, well, actually, we could make the core area four times bigger than for telecom, 400 times bigger, and the nonlinear effects and damage, of course, scale with the core area because uh, the intensity does. So here is a result. This is from my labs, um, obtained about uh, four years, five years ago, I think. Two and a half kilowatts, roughly, out of this fiber. So, I mean, that is just extraordinary stuff, right? Two and a half kilowatts out of one of these little fibers. Well, slightly bigger fiber than usual. The most important thing, though, to note is this. Because it's an optical fiber, because it's single transverse mode, the beam quality is virtually perfect. And this is what the beam profile looks. And, and trust me, high power lasers do not generally give you brilliant beam quality. There's a compromise. They tend to give you poorer quality beams. But this broke that barrier. And that had enormous implications. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. So this actually is the fiber laser in 1985. That's my hand. Then the first one kilowatt fiber laser was demonstrated at Southampton here. And in 2010, uh, we have a uh, fiber laser cutting through 35 millimeters of steel. So this is pretty impressive stuff. And you can see the impact that this is likely to have but I'll come back to some of the other important parts about these new laser technologies. Because, by the way, the fiber laser is only one. Because what's happening is the diode lasers, which are pretty poor in terms of beam quality, are finding their ways, A, very cheaply, at cost per watt, and are finding their ways into pumping all sorts of other optical lasers, um, sorry, optically pumped lasers. And that's a very important change. From the old days, of you saw Maimon with flash lamps, unbelievably inefficient. Even today's continuous lamps, very inefficient. The diode is really the key. So what we're talking about today are lasers which are brightness converters. They're taking existing lasers and turning them into better lasers. And that's a key tendency to watch out for. So what is a fiber laser? This actually is the original slide. <coughs> To my eternal shame, it doesn't have down here, as an example, uh, the euterbium, which is what is used uniquely today in virtually all uh, fiber lasers. But at that time, we demonstrated these, nidimium, erbium. Notice erbium here. We published 27 papers on erbium fiber lasers before we figured out it might be a good idea to take the, the mirrors off. So this is just laser jock thinking, right? You don't take the mirrors off. And it turns out that because of the length of the thing, you have anything up to 60 or 70 dBs of gain, not the 1 or 2% that we heard about earlier uh, in, in the talks on the helium neon. And this is a conventional way of doing things. You have a rod here, you have a resonator, and then you pump it with whatever your preferred form of optical pump is. And of course, the thing that hurts you every time is getting the heat out. You know, it's interesting that the laser physics has really turned into thermal engineering. And what this does is it distorts the resonator. It no longer matches the mirrors. You have to realign the mirrors and all those sorts of nasty things. They take a long time to turn on. They're very inefficient. And, of course, making it into some monolithic structure like this, where it's all contained in a fiber, you get this huge improvement in heat uh, resistance because of the huge surface area of the fiber, 
The core is just within 50 microns or so of the heat sink and a guided mode. This is very important. A guided mode resists thermal distortion because if it's guided by definition, the wave front is plane. Therefore, if you put, as I've illustrated here, plane mirrors on the end, it always matches whatever thermal characteristics exist within here. Now, in practice, you do this in an integrated way. You put Bragg gratings in that. So the great thing, and I'll show you more examples of this later, is that this is a monolithic structure. All, there's no air spaces. There's no surfaces to damage. It's an integrated, high-power technology. And, of course, we also have Charles Cow's amazing silica to make it from. So there were two ways, in fact, and this is, again, an interesting area because it was realized some 20 years ago, the point that I've just made, that it's all about thermal management. So you could take conventional slabs like this and make them thinner and thinner so that you get the heat out this way, or you could do this, which is pretty bad, really, because you've got to get it from the center to the outside, or you could make it very thin, like this, as a disk, or you could do the opposite and make it very long and very thin. So the two newcomers were long and thin or short and fat. And Adolf Giesen, widely credited with developing the disk laser technology, once said to me, this is from a, from a slide I actually gave when he was, we were doing a, a two-way Tweedledee and Tweedledum presentation, and uh, he said, you know, I thought about long and thin, I, made it, I may have made the wrong choice. But it isn't actually true. It depends horses for courses. And, you know, I haven't got time to go into it, but there are advantages to going short and fat as well. But let me talk more about my favorite topic, which is these are all fiber structures. So what we're doing here is we're stealing from the, t the telecoms technology, the, the hundreds of billions of dollars that were invested in telecoms research, in fiber technology. And those of us who are fortunate enough to have immersed ourselves in that area are able to bring in, and it's fantastic, you can recycle all your publications. Only they're laser publications now, not telecoms one. So here's one of the things that we did. We said, well, you know, you really don't want to stick in... Um, pump power from the ends of the thing, so why don't we do it from the side, which is exactly, of course, uh, what Maiman originally did, but we have the advantage that we've got fiber technology. So if you draw three fibers together, three or more, in a common plastic coating like this, and have your rare earth doped fiber here, then these two can be pump fibers. And if you then draw them in this fashion, you have what I call a strippable fiber laser. It's just like an electrical wire. You can strip the wires out. And this gives you then four pump ports. Really good. Because remember, part of this game is that the pumps that you're using are semiconductor lasers, and they're typically 10 watts each. That's the state of the art today. So if you want to make a kilowatt version, you've got to have to put 100 pumps into this thing. So the more ports you have, the better. And that's what happens with fiber technology. It's fantastic. So there's another thing that's different. Because these things are so long and thin, then you don't actually use lasers anymore. Actually, not true. If you remember, the word laser is light amplification. It's commonly used for an oscillator, but actually it's a light amplifier. And when you use fiber so-called lasers, this gets confusing, bear with me, there are actually a seed laser up here, which is a little semiconductor stolen from telecoms, through multiple chain of amplifiers to give you high power output with all the characteristics of a nicely controlled seed at the front. And these are called MOPAs. So front end, very, very good control, high power output, and this is what they look like. Notice something different. No twiddlets. You've seen all these people presenting wonderful slides, right? Twiddlets all over. There aren't any because it's all in the fiber. There's one switch on the front. That's it. And they come up in about a millisecond. 
And of course, the industrial guys just love this. You know, it's, it's just the same as any other piece of equipment in a factory. One switch, boom, it works. And IPG, which is a leading company in this area, has now demonstrated one or 10 kilowatts from a single one. But we're now stealing back again from all the wonderful things that have been done uh, in the area of high power lasers because this is actually using lasers to pump lasers just as uh, does the National Ignition Facility uh, in the US and Diamond here. So I don't have time to go through all this, so I won't, but these are just some figures. You can do single frequency, you can do picosecond, you can do femtosecond, you can do Q switching, and all with this incredible control because it's all in a guided wave structure. So applications are legion because these things are cheap, little boxes, switch on the front. So marking fruit so you don't have those damn sticky labels on them. Uh, this is some beautiful work from Germany um, in producing these tiny, tiny little devices by micro-machining. It's actually um, using uh, photochemistry to, to achieve this, and that's been hinted at earlier um, by the application of lasers in nanofabrication. Very exciting area. Femtosecond pulses. 80% of the world's stents are currently cut using fiber lasers. Because of their precision and because of the beam quality. I hope you never need a stent, but for those of you that don't know, these are devices that you insert into a collapsed artery um, to open it up again. So I mentioned NIF. I can't resist at the end of the day talking about the world's largest laser. Um, it's not quite that, because um, it's not fully operational yet, but it will be this, later this year, and it will then take over the mantle of the world's largest laser. And it uses fiber lasers for the entire front end. And this is from Chris Barty, um, who kindly lent me this slide. Um, fiber laser master oscillator room, fiber amplifiers all the way down, carrying polarized uh, light through PM fibers, as they're called, all the way to the chamber here. Why are they using fiber lasers? Again, because of a couple of characteristics. One, the gain medium is incredibly cheap, so you don't care how many you use. And the second thing is because they are so reproducible. So what they're actually doing at the front end here is they're synchronizing multiple fiber lasers to build up any pulse shape they want. Really exciting stuff. So uh, here's a couple of, uh, of fun things um, that I always show because not, a, not everybody understands high power. This is cutting through a breeze block in real time. This is about one kilowatt. So I'm trying to give you here the impression of what you can do with a kilowatt, never mind 10 kilowatts. And that's from a, from a fiber laser. And as you can see, it's pretty effective. And this is just one that represents, to my view, one of the best for showing what you can do in manufacturing, <laughs> in real time. Pretty impressive, huh? So, um, I want to finish by asking a question, because I am the last talk on lasers. I need to, we need to know how far this stuff is going. So let's ask the question, roughly how, how much power could we get out of a laser? And this is an interesting one because this is from an IPG fiber laser of four kilowatts. And the thing to note here is the working distance. And that, that comes because of the quality of the beam. If you're using a CO2 laser for this, it's typically one centimeter away. So, Let's think about that. That's four kilowatts. Now, we've got all this telecoms-related stuff. Let me relate you back to the talk then. We saw the development of the silica fiber for telecoms from Charles Cowell, which you will hear about this afternoon. You heard the idea that we'll scale it up because size matters to 40 uh, micron core, which is still single mode. Then we bring in all these other capabilities that we have, uh, most notably this, 
the microstructured fiber, which is related, as I pointed out, to the early days, which you'll hear from Pete Schultz uh, later in the development of silica technology. And as you can see here, the amazing microstructure full of holes. And you also have this device, which is the photonic band gap fiber, in which 99% of the power travels in the core, and therefore you have high power transmission capability. So how about a megawatt? Could we do a megawatt? Well, fiber lasers are actually ideal for power scaling because, as I pointed out, the medium is cheap. And you need to combine beams because 10 to 20 kilowatts is probably what you're going to get per laser. So how are you going to do that? Well, this is well-known stuff in lasers. You can use wavelength, you can use coherent, or you could use spatial. Spatial is fine uh, if you just, that just means you focus a multiple lasers onto a spot. If you want a coherent beam that's capable of going 100 kilometers, for example, then you really need to look at things like coherent beam combination. So where have we got to? This was work that we proposed to DARPA some while back, in which we said, why don't you just take the standard way of making fiber lasers, split the power, and put them into multiple amplifiers in a phased array. And if you can achieve that, and I've put one kilowatt, because this is the original slide from 2000, um, we would have a phase coherent output, and this would give you steering capability by changing the phase, and you've got built-in adaptive optics. Because trust me, uh, at a megawatt and above, adaptive optics of bending mirrors is not nice. If there's only one problem, you have to be single mode, single frequency, and single polarization if you're going to do that. And that is really hard in fiber lasers. And I haven't got time to tell you how we did this, but we have got up to 1.4 kilowatts, Brillo 1 free, which means that it satisfies all these requirements. And that has caused a lot of excitement and very considerable funding going on mostly in the US now. But, to finish with, let me bring us back to the context that Charles Towns was talking about. Because I'm doing two things here. One, I'm talking about beam combination, which is hardly a new idea. And secondly, this movie that I'm about to show you was made one year before Charles Towns was born. <laughs> this is the context of which, in which many of these ideas developed. Now this is a silent movie, obviously. You see here Archimedes, threatened by uh, the uh, Roman fleet, figuring out about how to do beam combination. Notice he doesn't know very much about the laws of reflection. And so the idea was that he would build a large mirror and he would harness the sun and burn the incoming Roman fleet. So this is the actual movie, 1914. And there you see his mirrors. adjusting the mirrors, which you wouldn't want to do if you had an incoming missile. The formidable Roman fleet is nothing but a dying bonfire. <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> Don't you love these old movies? So, if anybody thinks that that is unrealistic, let me point out that earlier this year a 747 flew um, out of the Air Force Base uh, in Albuquerque carrying a laser, not a fiber laser, but a very early generation of chemical laser called a coil laser and shot down incoming laser, uh, missiles. The next generation will, like all laser technologies, move towards solid state partly because nobody wants to fly the 747, right? It's full of chemicals. Okay, so let me finish. Uh, I've talked specifically about fiber lasers because we're going to hear all about fibers this afternoon. 
They're challenging conventional laser technology and continue to gain market share. They're around about 15% a year, cannibalizing older laser technologies. The exciting thing about them is they actually steal from telecom's fiber circuitry. And we expect up to 20 kilowatts in a year or two. That's probably about the limit in my view. And with beam combination, you might be able to scale these up to one megawatt uh, continuous wave uh, for the missile shield. So thank you for listening.